Canal. For St. Paddy's Day, he took on the Irish name Brill O'Head. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the church. We're going to mandate you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Love that about you. Comedian Brent Bella is in the studio. Conscious Bro is the name of his YouTube special. Very funny. I watch it this morning. Uh, where'd you film that thing, Brent? Thanks, man. Uh, shot it in San Diego about 10 months ago down at a Mic Drop We've Comedy Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have been there. Yeah. I was looking at it and I thought, have I been there? Yeah. It's got like a trippy Alice in Wonderland yeah. kind of design, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a good time. I don't have that recollection for really? some reason. <laughs> well, it's, That's a really like unusual backdrop. Hey, maybe I blocked it out. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Uh, <laughs> Brent uh, has got dates um, that we may or may not get to. I'm trying to think. Do you have dates? I do have dates. Oh, okay. I got a couple of dates. I got uh, Florida in late March, San Jose, San Francisco, Sacramento in May, a um, bunch of other ones in between. So where do we go for that? Brentpella.com slash shows. Oh, okay. Would be great. All right. That's the place. Put that on here. You follow him at Brent Pella. He puts his dates on there, too, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, put. Should we put that on this thing? Well, yeah, but he, he he comes on to promote his. He's coming on to promote his YouTube. That's what we're. But YouTube I always special. say go to go to follow him at something, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it says Instagram. Follow him at. Oh, Brent Instagram Pella. at Brent Pella. Oh, okay. And we can get your dates there. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then everything's then everywhere because the internet is a nightmare. I don't know. <laughs> right? how, I don't know how anything <laughs> works. <Everywhere. laughs> I have to like just drown people so, in information. So you're doing a Bobby Kennedy Jr show yeah coming up. yeah uh this coming saturday so a couple days i guess before this gets released um mm-hmm. performing at a big wellness event out in austin texas um i'm opening for him technically they got me mm-hmm. going up right before him so we'll see how he closes and how much time are you doing 15 uh and stand up yeah 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 and do you do you pick through your act and go, this would be good for this crowd? I do. I'm going to probably reserve the dick jokes for a different venue. Um, this feels like a little bit more upscale of a yeah. crew. Uh, but yeah, I got you know typically some political stuff that kind of goes both ways. and uh, It'll be a good time. I like to mock How'd everybody. you get connected with uh, Kennedy? Um, through a buddy of mine who was organizing an event out in L.A. a few months ago, and he asked me to perform then. Uh, and then just getting more involved with his team. I got to know a couple of the people that work with people out in Austin, Texas, like Aubrey Marcus and a few others in the health and wellness space. Um, so we kind of floated around each other's circles for a minute, and mm-hmm. now it's it's cool to get to know them. They're really cool people. Yeah. He's surrounded himself with some, some good folks. Have you thought about how you're going to bring him up? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask for his credits, and I think <laughs> I'll just run through a list of people he sued, and, <laughs> and then I'll say... Here's Bobby. Yeah, entities. He entities. Sued. Entities. Yeah. He sued. Yeah. Yeah. He's an impressive guy, and he's a real guy. And it's it's now be prepared because you will be attacked by whatever the Austin local newspaper oh, is for sure. And then uh, for sure the L.A. Times 100%. is not going to be happy. They no. may have written the review already. <laughs> yeah. so, I hope so. I, I've been praying to get canceled from years. It's not just to get a be boost a good, to my career. It's not going to be a good review. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's also it, it feels so counterintuitive to me because he seems so much like what that side of the aisle wanted my entire life. Yeah. And now they hate him. Did you see his State of the Union, his 10 minute video clip? He, he did his own State of the Union. Oh, I didn't. I ago. was at an event. I was at his birthday party where he did about, about an hour and 10 minute State oh, cool. of the Union. Yeah. <laughs> and it it's impressive. Yeah. And, um, I know no one wants to take the time to get to know anybody, which is part of the, the sad part about, mm-hmm. you know, the times we're living in. But if you take the time to get to know him, I think you'll you'll find him impressive. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to agree on everything. You'll just find him to be substantial. Yeah. I think that's that's, for me, where we're kind of living. There's so many politicians that, and news people and people like that who who don't feel substantial yeah to me like you can be on this side of the aisle that side of the aisle but i think you have to admit that 
Bobby Kennedy Jr. is like much more substantial than Kamala Harris, who does not feel substantial. And yeah. then then they would go, well, maybe you should listen to her talk for an hour, and then maybe you would feel yeah, that, see if that you way. Can see the difference between the two. Yeah. I, I kind of think I would, though. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't. That's that's my thing. I, I I when she speaks for five minutes, she could say something substantial in that five minutes. I just never, I never hear it. I never hear it. Yeah. But it's also interesting that we're living in a time where people aren't really attracted to those kinds of ideas. Right. And you would hope that people were more attracted to the substance of something that Bobby talks about because he backs it up with a history lesson every time. Yes. He goes into depth about where we were, where we are, where we could be. Yes. And it just feels like he actually has more than just buzzwords and generalized language to share. I I agree. And so maybe we'll 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 inch that way. I, I had I was thinking about politics when I was so something I've been thinking about for a long time is how we are divided in in such a fashion that it's really pretty much statistically 50-50, which which feels statistically like an anomaly mm -hmm. for me. And, and so if you said, um, well, you have the New England Patriots and then you have the Cleveland Browns. And then s someone said, yeah, the nation is 50-50 Patriots fans and 50-50 Browns fans. And then I would go, well, that seems weird because the Browns – or losing franchise who haven't won a Super Bowl, and then the Patriots have a whole bunch of Super Bowl rings, so why is it 50-50? But it's still 50-50. And so here's the, here's the concept I'm going to float to you. Um, the 50-50 part that's vexing to me, when the country was closer – in terms of, you know, if you hear Bill Clinton give speeches from the 90s and he's talking about immigration or the border or something like that, he sounds like a Republican today mm -hmm. and he's a Democrat, but it sounds very reasonable, you know, and 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 then I think if you would have said to somebody who was a Republican and we even have that Joe Biden, was it Joe Biden? No, it was a Chuck Schumer thing from like 06. I yeah, think we have Oh, nine, where he's kind of given a speech. If so, you go back to Bill Clinton, Democrat, and he gives his speech on immigration. And then you'd say to someone on the right, what would you think of the speech? And they'd go, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm what, on board. that's, that's what we think yeah. too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a kind of like, uh, I'm a nutritionist, but I work at Gold's Gym and you're a nutritionist and you work at power lifting 101 and then but that guy's talking about diet and exercise and then you ask the other guy what'd you think of the other guy's speech and goes eh, diet and exercise yeah i mean it's hard to yeah hard to find fault yeah in that so we do agree on that yeah we think our gym's better but we're about the okay. we're about the same we're about the same yeah so that it made sense that we're kind of knotted up 50 50 in the past but now that side is talking about you know basically arguing over the the word illegal versus immigrant right. know, versus gas <laughs> right. worker or whatever <laughs> and it seems to be a lot of trans talk a uh, like whole lot a whole lot of trans talk yeah and so now logically you'd go well this side wants to lower taxes and make gas cheaper and, and food cheaper and wants a stout border. And then the other side wants to talk about Ukraine and trans talk. Mm -hmm. Then you'd go, well, there's a whole lot of people are going to drift away and want to talk about cheaper gas than trans talk. But we're still 50-50. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about it, like why, from a sociological standpoint, why 50-50? How, how is it possible that we're really literally... 50-50. We're, we're coming into election. We have no idea who's going to win, and it's going to be settled. You know, the last one was, I don't know, 11,000 votes or 40,000 40, votes in five different states that could have mm -hmm. gone, you know, this way or that way. And then I started thinking about any relationship I've ever been in. And I thought, well, that's 50-50. That's man and that's woman. And then I realized there's always been lots of arguments. But I'm not even sure what the arguments have been about historically. Like, 
I was talking to Dr. Drew on the ride in, and I was sort of floating this thought. And I said, every argument you've got in your wife, or 86% of the arguments, did they have to happen? He's like, absolutely not. There, there was no, there's no reason to argue over it. And then I realized maybe that's the dynamic. Maybe we like to argue. Oh, we love to argue. And maybe it'll stay 50 50 just because we like to argue. And the minute it goes 80 20, we, we kind of stop arguing. It's mm-hmm. just there's a majority rule. This is the way yeah. we do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, I, and then maybe it's that dynamic that male-female marriage couple dynamic, the 50-50 that argues essentially over nothing, but constantly and consistently, maybe we're just projecting that into society. So maybe we're 50-50 just because we want to argue, because most of these subjects seem pretty cut and dry to me. Yeah. We love to argue, and I think we don't like to give in. People, People don't like to cede to others. Right. You know, people love these days to have the status position. And if you can start an argument and maintain that argument and keep figuring out ways to keep the argument going, then you keep your status held above other people. Right. So if there if there are 10 people, let's say I have 10 employees. Yeah. And I go, "Where are we going to lunch?" And uh half of them says uh we're doing sushi and the other half says kebab. Mhm. Then we're going to have an argument. Yeah. And it's 50, it's five against five, and that's going to go on for a long time. But what I'm saying is the second we get eight of them on kebab and two on sushi, we're not arguing anymore. We're just right. going to the kebab place. Right, unless the uh, host at the sushi place is trans. <laughs> and then we're going to argue. And then you're going to argue even more. <laughs> so yeah. we'll, we'll play you this. And the reason I'm going to play it to you, Chuck Schumer, um, this is from 09. This isn't from uh, 1957. Now, this is this is modern era shit. And and just listen what he sounds like. Illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. Until the American people are convinced that we will stop future flows of illegal immigration, we will make no progress on dealing with the millions of illegal immigrants who are here now and on Mm. rationalizing our system of legal immigration. When we use phrases like undocumented workers, (laughs) we convey a message to the American people that their government is not serious about combating illegal immigration, which the American people overwhelmingly oppose. If you don't think it's illegal, you're not going to say it. I think it is illegal and wrong. People who enter the United States without our permission are illegal aliens, and illegal aliens should not be treated the same as people who entered the U.S. legally. Wow. All right. That was a few years ago. <laughs> you know what I always think about? I go, Chuck Schumer was 59 when he made this proclamation. So how radically are my views going to change on any subject right. once right. I hit my 62nd birthday or my 71st <laughs> right. birthday? You got an immediate so switch to racist phobic. I so know, naive. like, people yeah. do that thing where it's like, I was in college and I got caught up uh-huh. in the movement. Uh-huh. We smoked a lot of weed. We listened to a lot of Jefferson Airplane. And I, that was kind of a different version of me. Now I got a tie and I work for a law firm or uh-huh. something, you know, but... This ain't that. You this can't is, do that he's when you're 60, gray. He's 60. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going, this is what's going on. So what <laughs> happened to this Chuck? What, why are you, 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 you literally just told us, use the word illegal. Do not call Don't it. Don't undoc- call them document. And he said illegal aliens. Right. He said aliens. Right. That's like the worst, <laughs> now, according to everybody on the left. Now yeah. you're pissed that someone didn't say guest of the United States. Right. right. So now what am I to think? <laughs> am I to think that you actually changed your opinion? And then, again, at that ripe old age of 60? No. People, and it wasn't that day. That's what yeah. he sounded like when he was 60. He changed his opinions at 70. That's wild. Pa- past that age, you're not changing opinions. You're you're going with whatever other people, whatever the popular way of thinking is. If the, you that, yes, if you are racist at age sixty, at age sixty seven, you hate blacks more. More, the, the, more. The hatred around. goes up. You yeah, can't like, slow it down. My my granddaughter brought home Lucius, and I changed <laughs> my feelings on. Yeah. No, nope, you kicked him out of the house. You kicked him out. 
Yeah, so... It's the same with, like, Nancy Pelosi coming back to run for Speaker of the House again, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't she running again still? Or I, is that I done? Don't, I, don't, I don't know that I... Th- I, when 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 my teenage son is on his deathbed in his eighties, he's going to ask me if Nancy Pelosi is still in charge, and I'm going to. You're going to have to say no. I'm going to lie to him. Oh, okay, cool. You'll lie because I want choice. him to go in peace. Yeah. You know what I, mean? like, <laughs> I, I can't in, envision a world where she's yeah. not behind a microphone saying something fucking stupid. It's it's wild. These people are so old. And I don't understand. I was watching Biden's State of the Union, mm-hmm. just wondering why that man isn't retired on an island somewhere. The Epstein one is free now. Right. Uh, go back, hang out, have a beer if your body can process it. Right. And take some time off. You've had a hell of a career. Yeah. Now, don't have a beer and ride a bike around the island. Don't ride a bike. On, maybe that'll actually give him better oh, balance. I right. don't know. Um, but I just, I don't know. I feel like there should be an age limit. These people are getting too old, dude. There's an well, age minimum. I, there should be an age maximum. I'm an ageist. I'm an ageist. My, okay. About politics. <laughs> so my feeling is that we don't need to assign a number, but, you know, you do have to take a driver's test, you know, after the age of, sure. I don't know, 75. You have to take one yeah. once a year or something yeah. like that, which, which does not mean um, Norman Lear – could be on the road driving his vehicle at 95 because he was sharp as a tack mm-hmm. and he died at 101 or whatever whatever it was. But my dad shouldn't be driving at 95, right? right? So right. I, I don't want to ascribe a number Maybe not a number. Maybe just it. a series of like regulations. Punt pass you know? and kick competition. Yeah, Let's go if old you, school. If, you're having, if you need to balance the budget, can you also walk up a flight of stairs unassisted? Yeah, stress right. test for these. A stress <laughs> test. Is your phone screen enlarged to 120% or more? You right. know, like, that, like let's have a series of guidelines we could follow yes. for the people who operate with the nuclear codes. Uh, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, like I said, technically, Kennedy is 70. I think 70 used to be old. 70 used to be old, but, but he's guys, banging out the like guys, 20 pull-ups in a row. The guy's jacked. Super jacked. He's smart. He's fast. He's articulate. Like, every synapse is firing. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason to go, well, we can't have a 70-year-old in there. Yes, we could have that. That 70-year-old. Guys I went to high school with, you wouldn't have wanted at 37. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right, right, right. He's sharp. So I I wouldn't, I don't like the age, but I do like the punt, pass, and kick competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give him a physical test (laughs) and a mental test. And a mental. And a mental test. Test For sure. As well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So... uh, the stand up. So, so how long have you been doing stand up? Uh, I've been old. performing for like ten years, about ten years since I got down here after college. Um, Where did you grow up? Grew up in Davis, up by Sacramento. Uh, oh. Moved down, went to school in Santa Barbara, um, and then hopped down to LA shortly after. Mm. Um, are you Mike Dawson? Mike Dawson <laughs> Mike went Dawson. to school. And <laughs> I followed that same path. Did you really? Except I did. I grew up in in the Bay Area in Concord. Oh, nice. Went to school at Davis. Went there for a year. Uh-huh. Got, got arrested and thrown in Yolo County Detention Center, as we spoke of earlier. Sure. Uh, and then got kicked out of school and then went to Santa Barbara. Oh, my God. We've been arrested in so many similar places. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I'm going to look there. like. I can't wait. Well, Dawson, <laughs> you just got off the rock and roll cruise, right? Yeah, cruise to the edge, the prog rock cruise. Oh, this prog is the cruise rock. that Mike Lynch would love. Oh, he would love it. Uh, I love prog rock, too. Loxamana would love it, too. What was yes. the average uh, set number? Two songs a set? Oh no, they were they were uh, going like the big bands were going an hour. Um, Forty minutes was maybe the shortest of mm-hmm. sets, but they were they were they were mainly hour long sets. It's constant music on the boat from constant live bands, uh, sometimes five going at the same time, mm-hmm. um, um, from ten a.m. until two a.m. Wow! Yeah, damn. Fucking, because you know, hard. <laughs> it's not the guy. The guys who bought the tickets are in, into it. The Indonesian 
bartender who had to fucking sit there and listen to Ina Gata DeVita for the 45th time. Yeah, the crew. Fucking, I don't know Shrugging what this keyboards everywhere. I don't even know what this is. If I hear another Emerson, Lake, and Palmer cover band, I'm going to fucking put, a, put this, I'll put this uh, corkscrew to my temple. Speaking of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, like I, when I introduced bands, I work in, you know, 35 to one minute bursts. That's mm -hmm. it. Get up on stage, get the people fired up, introduce the band, get off the stage, disappear. Um, but I try to work in some stand-up as I go. And uh, I said, I said at one point, I you know, got up there and said, uh, cruise to the edge, let me hear you. Everybody goes, you know, I've been thinking, uh, it's, it's weird that um, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer did the song in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that should have been Genesis. Yes. <laughs> and... Two people in the crowd go, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I talked to them. We, what, you don't like that one? They got better. The one joke I couldn't tell on this is that it's really weird that Genesis was better the second time around. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's another thought-provoking joke. Mm. But if I told that joke on this boat, I would have gotten physically attacked. Oh. Um, so Genesis minus Phil Collins, you're saying? No, Phil Collins was in it, but Peter Gabriel was oh, the lead of that's Genesis right. back he's, then. And he they, was playing the drums. They uh, No, no, he was, he was the singer. No, Phil Collins. Phil Collins was on the drums. Yes, I'm sorry. I, Man, that shouldn't have been confusing. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, but what do you got? So what well, bands were on the cruise? Uh, let's see. Martin Barr from Jethro Tull All right. um, performed... Uh, two Jethro Tull sets without mm -hmm. the flute. Okay. Uh, he got a singer that uh, looks and sings like Ian Anderson. Oh, boy. And it's, you know, it's basically more heavy metal um, Tull. All right. Really good stuff. Um, had uh, a bunch of bands I had never heard of. Uh, Clone, Haken. Um, uh, do you remember a band called Wishbone Ash? No. Okay. They were a uh, like 70s prog rock group. Um, but I brought Sounds my... like an old black blues singer. It's at, with it's bad a, elbows. Yeah. Wishbone right. Ash. <laughs> <laughs> he sung... He had... His hit was Where's the Nivea? <laughs> <laughs> you have to care about hand care. To yeah, get that's that right. <laughs> yeah. Um, your job uh, in, in Jeopardy. All right, well, what's your Dawson? story, Dawson? You had a story. Well, I the, walked in and Chris crew. said, Hey, did anybody fall off the boat? Uh -huh. I said no, but uh, one one story. There's a band, uh, excellent prog rock band called Marillion, mm -hmm. and they play every cruise to the edge you know, several times. And and um, a big fan favorite. Well, they played in the theater, mm -hmm. and I found out after the fact that you know the food on a cruise ship ain't that great. You you get you get loose with the bowel movements mm -hmm. after a few days. Mm -hmm. Well, someone um, during the Marillion show in the theater, in the nice place, um, shat their seat mm -hmm. aggressively. Mm -hmm. Aggressively. Uh, mm -hmm. and sat in it mm -hmm. the entire show. Mm, that's a that's a tip of the cap to the band. <laughs> Must be a good band. <laughs> yeah. You come to one of my stand-up shows and shit yourself, you would be you're in a hasty <laughs> retreat. <laughs> yeah, you're getting up. Nah. And then followed everyone else out at exit time and left a trail. Oh, no. wow. All the way out. Wow. And, you know, I, I felt awful for the person because they know who he is. Uh, I never found yeah, out. I asked, I asked people to point him out. Like, I want to see. I want to see this guy. But uh, You can uh, find out felt, which guy it felt was. totally bad for the guy. Um, he was getting the uh, Cuddy Sark and Metamucil shots at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at one point uh, during, the, during the cruise, uh, uh, a good uh, Mike Dawson moment. Um, I found out there's a band uh, called Goblin, mm. and Goblin is famous for doing the score for B movie horror films. Mm, makes sense. And so they they played horror music, and they're all Italian. Mm -hmm. And when I'm watching them sound check and get ready, uh, they're just speaking Italian to each other. Mm -hmm. And the engineer conveys to the leader of the band, "This is as good as it's going to get." Va bene, meaning is. Okay, mm -hmm. va bene. And then the guy on stage says, va bene. It's okay. So I go to introduce this band the next time they play, and I'm like, I'm going to use all 12 Italian words I know in mm -hmm. this intro. 
<clears throat> and I get on stage and say, buongiorno, cruise to the edge. Que cosa va? Va bene? <laughs> and everyone's just looking at me, and I go again, va bene? And every, the whole crowd goes, va bene? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, uh, the other two words I know in Italian are andiamo e aspetta, which essentially translates to hurry up and wait. This mm -hmm. is what we've been doing for the last few days. Da, 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 da. And so um, the, um, then I introduced Goblin. They came on stage and they all looked at me with uh, a plum. They, they were very happy. They, mm. they, felt, they felt adored that someone dared to speak Italian or try mm -hmm. to speak Italian and bring them up and on stage. And they sing in English? They don't sing. Oh, oh, oh just it's just it's all the instrumental. instrumental. There were a lot of instrumental bands. Oh really? Um, and what is prog rock? Progressive rock. It's it's essentially I could describe it by it's yes. Prog rock is the band yes. Okay. Um, Rush is prog rock. Rush. Okay. Uh, Queensrÿche was on this ship. I had uh, I had lunch with the uh, drummer Casey. It was a good time. Um, I was raised on the Grateful Dead. Oh, you were? Yeah. Because yeah. your parents. Yeah, my mom was like an 80s, 90s deadhead, so she raised me on The Dead and Stevie Nicks, and she brought me to see... I, I, I went to, I think, four or five dead shows when Jerry was still alive. Oh, really? Yeah. Your mom yeah. took you? Mm -hmm. Now, was your mom rolling on something? At the time, she probably. Mm -hmm. I think she was she was smoking a lot of pot uh -huh. at the time. Yeah. She was young. She had me young. I think she was like 22, 23. So, so she liked the dead, and she liked... I, Stevie Nicks is sort of like women who like scarves oh, a yeah. lot and yeah, gypsy yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, like it's yeah. A, gypsy vibe. It's billowy. Yes. They're not yeah. the Jane Fonda crowd. No, like They don't no. wear a lot of clingy, tight-fitting outfits. No, they wear a lot of loose fabrics and linen. Yeah, which yeah. I I would suggest to any of my female rockers when you go, you know, when they're in their prime and they're really nines and tens and tight as snare drums, don't go out there with the Pat Benatar spandex <laughs> on. Don't do it. Get into the flowing, scarvy, yeah. gypsy, you know, the... You know, the sort of billowy skirts and stuff yeah. like that. And then they go, why? I want to show it off. And it's like, yeah, but 25 years from now when you're a fat ass, no, <laughs> no. people are going to know you made the move to the moo right. moo. You right. know what I mean? Right. Like, right. Do it now. <laughs> grandfather it yeah. in. And no one will no one Establish will say anything. your position. Yeah. Right. Let, wear something that has people looking at you saying, oh, I bet she does magic. You don't want to be like the old porn star who's wearing the corset. No. You know what I mean? Because we know what that's for. Yeah. But if you wear it early in your career, then that'll just be your thing. Mm -hmm. So you've seen Stevie Nicks a few times. I don't know if I ever, if she ever got me to go see Fleetwood Mac, but I saw The Dead a bunch. And mm. also, um, she used to bring me to all the the hippie fests in Northern, Northern California, like Reggae on the River, a uh, bunch. Of, I was like the little naked boy running around <laughs> eating applesauce and <laughs> yeah my mom my mom was shit. a weird <laughs> yeah. weird hippiness too mm -hmm. and we used to go the problem with the hippie moms is they don't really they're not into babysitters that much they, <laughs> yeah they don't really decide what would be appropriate for an eight-year-old right. they just bring you and you hang out everywhere yeah. and uh my mom used to be part of there was some house in L.A. and it was called the Do It Now Foundation. It was basically drug something. I don't know. People flopping, mm -hmm. smoking spleef, like hanging out. But what what hippie moms do is they kind of decide that you should be exposed to things, yeah, and that this would be a good thing. Except for it's not. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's damaging. <laughs> you, you, you know what clearly, I mean? Yeah. Clearly, yeah. I chose to be a comedian. Cheer, clearly damaging, <laughs> but they, they bring you everywhere, and they introduce you. I mean, my mom was such a hippie that she had friends named Happy, Sunshine, Axis, and <laughs> Zorback. <laughs> Whose name was probably Glenn, you know? Of course. And then I got to go along with hanging out yeah. with Zorback, you know what I mean? 
And also, you don't know what crazy losers these people are because you're a kid and they're an adult. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, he's got his own VW van. So he's got to be he's doing pretty be good. Super cool. Yeah, he's 41. Well, I, I go to a ton of music festivals these days. I, oh, and I, I perform at a lot of them too. And, and a lot of them are like the Burning Man esque mm-hmm. desert festival. And I've mm-hmm. met people named Tsunami. I've met a Jaguar. <laughs> I've met a Moon. Like I've met three Moons. Oh yeah. Uh, I've met Oracle. I've met Halo. I've met Soul Soul. That's two souls. Two souls. First name Soul. Second name Soul. Uh huh. Um, I know four different people who live on a bus, and they seem to be happy. They seem to be very dirty and smelly. But there's a there's a there's a happiness that maybe it's a front. I don't know how happy you can be living on a bus, but I you know I wish them the best, and it the, seems like they're having a good time. The name changers. That's the, a big thing. It's not a game changer. It's no, just a name no, changer. It's just a name change. <laughs> at uh, at some point, <laughs> at some point, my sister Lauren L A U R E N decided it was going to be L A U R Y N. Uh, and I was just like, why? Why? <laughs> why? How's this going to change our horrible You're not past? getting more points in Scrabble <laughs> There's for nothing. This. Yeah. There's nothing this can do for you. But it's <laughs> like, I'm doing it. It's like, I... I, it's up there with like a fourth piercing or something. It's yeah, just like, yeah. how is this moving the needle? <laughs> I, it, it does. I don't want to sound like Spock from Star Trek, you know, uh-huh. illogical. But it's like this, you know, getting an advanced degree sounds like something. Learning Taekwondo sounds mm-hmm. like something. Learning uh how to tan leather and make your own sure belts and satchels yeah. and box. Th- this Move all to sounds a new like country, something. Learn a language, you start a career. Changing your name just. Mm. <laughs> it's not really the catalyst for much. I don't. I, but, that I've seen. Well, here's why I don't like it. I think I have this theory that not only are a lot of these things a waste of time, but they're sort of destructive. And the reason I think they're destructive is because I think they're, they satiate. So you go, what did you do? And they go, oh, I got an MBA. And okay. What'd you do? I changed my name to Zorback. Oh, okay. So we're both good. <laughs> yeah. like, no, no, we're not. You didn't do anything. You know what I mean? And I feel this way sort of globally when I hear about like all the movements and all the marches and all the blowhards up there screaming about dignity and having a seat at the table and then everyone's like shaking, nodding their head and going, we need dignity and uh, we we need a seat at the table and we need to be treated with respect and something. And then you, everyone just goes home mm-hmm. and nothing changes, but you feel like something was done. You know, it's it's this thing where you go, you're not allowed to say, you know, illegal alien. You can just say undocumented worker or something. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, but there's still a whole bunch of fucking people flooding across <laughs> yeah. the border. Like, all you've done is said, no, you can't say colored person. You have to say person of color. And then everyone went, all right, oh, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, then no, our, sure, our work sure. is done. Yeah, and then yeah. w- are we in Black History Month or Gay History right. Month or Gay Pride <laughs> Week or Black or Bi? Or trans Month. We trans, trans Month. month or, this is Trans Month. month. Okay. Yeah. And then what they do? They put the gay flag on the Pepsi can. Right. Okay, that's good. Now we're good. Now we're good. Now we're Everything's good. Everything's solved. We're solved. We're <laughs> yeah. go. Hold on. It's a two way street. <laughs> we got to get the gay flag on the Pepsi can, and then we got to get that founding father who owned gays. We yeah. got to tear that statue down. Mm-hmm. So if we can get that old guy on the horse down, and we can get the flag up on the can. Because he owned blacks and gays, and no right. one talks about that. And make sure you make the trans flag the Uber car in the app, so that when oh, it's driving around, it's not a car. Right, it's right. A, it's a trans and, flag. And if you go to West L.A., you'll see the sheriff's car has the gay flag on the jumble yeah. on the side underneath. Right. So That's when good. it's pulling up to you as you're getting mugged and fucked in the ass, right. you know you're going to be okay. <laughs> Not because in that you order. Got the gay cop yeah. coming to save you. Yeah. Now we're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I feel it satiates. Yes. And it's it's no different than when they elected Barack Obama. It was like, okay, finally, we got a black guy in there. Now he's going to do shit for us. Mm-hmm. And then he does no, he does nothing for you. 
Just like Zorbak, Zorbak. going from Glenn mm-hmm. to Zorbak didn't change his world. Right. But you feel <laughs> like you've done something. Yeah. Which I feel that way about tattoos and piercings, and I just feel that way about everything. Yeah. Even certain cars you drive or wristwatches or I something. Feel a majority just, of politics is just making it seem like you're doing stuff. Right. A majority of it is how can you stay ahead of the people who are calling you out for not doing anything. It's also weird, and then they get caught up in this thing where he goes, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Yeah. And everyone goes, oh, yeah. Yeah. He thought Good. of a new way of talking about stuff. Yeah. All right. He I haven't heard that one before. He's going to take the ones at the bottom. And he's going to take the <laughs> bottom dwellers. Up. He's going to put them up. And, and then <laughs> the people in the middle, they got to spread out yeah. to make room for the guys at the bottom, <laughs> who's like a bike rack. Yeah, and then you from know the what bottom I mean? left, you can make those go diagonally, and then the bo- bottom right can go diagonally in the other way. It's going to be like a star. Yeah. And that's how we're shi- We're going to shine like stars. You can make this country shine again. And <laughs> we're going to offer them a seat at the table, <laughs> and their voice is going to be heard. Yeah. <laughs> and then everyone goes, yeah, that's what we're doing. Dude. He was so jacked up on stimulants during that State of the Union address. That was great. He was so jacked up. Um, I hope, this is a true hope, is that he drops for some reason and we get Gavin Newsom on the ticket. Yeah. Oh, I'm, that'd I'm be pray- awesome. I'm praying. I'm literally, I'm praying on it daily. It's part of my morning routine <laughs> to look at the sun and ask for a Gavin Newsom ballot. You know, I, it's funny watching Biden when he's, Beaked up and hopped up and yeah. juiced up at at the State of the Union, you know, and he's fired up and he's yelling at everybody and he's yelling about the bottom up and the middle over and the top down. <laughs> yeah. And then he's going diagonal with the yeah. t- with the th- three richest people on the planet. He's yeah. got his whole uh-huh. he's got his whole tic tac toe game board going up there. Um, it's it's when he's all fired up and he's all beaked up, and then we see him the next day and he's given he's in front of you know some union textile union or something and he's up there and he's like gosh shit what was my dog's name I, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. it's like but you know what he reminds you of it's it's kind of like if you had one of those friends that partied real hard and like that night like you you left him at 2 a.m and he was on standing on top of a keg yelling drink from your helmets yeah you know what i mean like just fucking screaming we're all vikings yeah you know, drink yeah. from your fucking helmets you pussy and then the next day you saw him at in the kitchen at like 10 a.m and he's looking for coffee and you're like how you doing steve he's like oh, don't talk to me like fuck it what the fuck happened last happened night last night also uh, my name's not steve anymore uh, it's dragon yeah so. Oh, making fuck. a change. I don't know where today. my car is. Do you know where my car is? <laughs> yeah. I can't find my car. Or I'm missing a flip flop. Like that's what yeah. when Biden comes down. Yeah, that's what he sounds He's, like. He sounds like the guy that's experiencing a hangover after chugging half a liter of Fireball. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Biden. Yeah. Interesting times. I'm, I'm so excited for this year. It's something insane is going to happen, whether it's aliens or Newsom on the ballot or Biden chopping his dick off to show his support for the left. You, yeah. Something's going to happen. <laughs> I know. And I just can't wait to see what it is. I know. I have this. It's a narcissistic thought because every generation thinks that they're the generation that is going to experience the rapture. Right. So we all right. go oh, this is going to happen on our watch. You know, and then thousands of years goes by and no one experienced did you have, anything. Did you have a, a thought like that when you were younger? No. In your I, early voting days? Was it ever like, oh, shit, this could all be over? Real no, well, while well, I'm older than you and I got the steady diet, so I got the planet end of the world kind of. Um, at the beginning... It was a lot of Soviet Union end of the world stuff. Right, right, right. So it was a lot of nuclear, you know, missiles stuff. And then that gave way to a sort of global, uh, I think they called it an ice age back then. So then then, then there was going to be an ice age and we're going to be out of fossil fuels and so on and so forth. So it's what we do, what we've done my in my lifetime is we have toggled in between Soviet Union end of the world and global warming ice age 
end of the world. Right. And now our kids are lucky because they get both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, used to, we used to do Soviet end of the world for a uh, while, and then it, we'd burn out on it. We'd take a little break, and we'd go, all right, we got to find an Indian who's crying now. Yeah. And we got to talk <laughs> about ecology and recycling and garbage and being out of fossil fuels and stuff. And we'd give that a while, and then we'd go back to the Soviet thing. Sting would write a song about the Soviet moms <laughs> loving their kids, too. And we'd go back to that. Then we'd get bored with that because eventually, like, you can only talk about Africanized killer bees coming in from Mexico for so right. many years before event. Right. But at some point, you go, has anyone ever been stung by a killer bee? And if the answer is no, and it's been 17 years, we go, all right, fuck it. We got to move on. <laughs> We're moving on to a new animal. Maybe the chupacabra. You, you know, like, yeah. we, we move on. We yeah. got to move on. Yeah. But now we're at this place where there's enough panic room in our brain where we can go Putin's puppet and 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 Trump's going to be the cat's paw of Putin. He's going to do his bidding and mm-hmm. he has the goods on him. Yeah. And we're heading toward a nuclear wasteland. And we got Greta Thunberg yeah. <laughs> talking yeah. to us yeah. about the polar caps melting and the seas rising. So yeah. my kids are fucked. fucked. They got a deal. <laughs> and... Uh, Murder horner, hornets or uh-huh. killer hornet wasps or whatever, they're not off the table either. No, they're buzzing around still. No, it's only been 10 years. We got murder months. hornets. Yeah. We got Africanized killer bees. We yeah. got the Soviet Union with all their nukes aimed at us. And we got seas rising and lakes boiling mm-hmm. and mountains crumbling. So yeah. look forward to that. Yeah, we got options. But we got options. If you get an electric car, an electric leaf blower, <laughs> this could all fine. go away. This could this all change. This will all change if you get electric lawnmower. Get an electric lawnmower. It'll all end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> there's that. There's something the you can do about solution. it. It's yeah. Basically, the electric car is the modern version of rosary beads. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> Here, just rub these. I'm, f- I'm feeling a lot of anxiety about the end of the world. Yeah, yeah here's some beads. Yeah. Just, ru- rub, just these, rub, that. rub these beads. Get the electric yeah. car. Here's a crickets. Prius. Right. Don't worry about Have it. Have a burger made of lettuce. That's right. And, and crickets. And, and everything will be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we sorted that out. What yeah. a nightmare. Oh, my God. Look, the new world order is... Um. In terms of global warming, you can do nothing. In terms of the Soviets launching an all-out nuke attack on us, you can do nothing. And um, Africanized killer bees, you can do nothing. And COVID, Mm -hmm. you can do nothing. Mm -hmm. So join me (laughs) in doing nothing. Do nothing. Just do nothing. Do nothing. Now, doing nothing will not mean it won't happen. It just means you didn't wait in line at a CVS right. while something is happening. Right. You, you will have the same effect. So there you go. Yeah. Do you and, have a plan for if shit goes down? Or are you no, going to die in the my, winds? I, I think I would be the guy. All those movies, those natural disaster movies, eventually there's a tidal wave yeah. or a tsunami. There's always the water. Yeah. And then there's the people on the beach. And they break down into three groups. There's the groups of young people trying to run for the hills Mm -hmm. and and inevitably knocking someone off an enduro motorcycle and jumping on it. (laughs) No one ever calls that guy Dick because he's the hero. I was like, how about the guy who bought the enduro? (laughs) Right. And that's his motorcycle. He was ready for this moment. He fucking gassed that thing up. He put two stroke in it. Yeah. He mixed it right. And now he's leaving on his Kawasaki. (laughs) You just knocked him off? Because you got a girlfriend we care about? <laughs> like no one ever thinks about that guy. Who's the poor guy who always gets pulled off the motorcycle? He he's shopping in town. He's mm-hmm. running from a tsunami. He's he's prepped. He's prepped. He's literally the prep. Why do you get to knock him off his motorcycle? <laughs> yeah. But all right. There's three groups. There's the the young people who are heading for the hills. Then there is the elderly couple who just stands on the beach as the shadow mm-hmm. of the tidal wave. And they embrace. Mm -hmm. The conceit is they've lived enough. They've loved enough. They're going together. I would be in the third group that's underrepresented, which I'd be running toward the tidal wave. (laughs) I'd be like, I want to be the tip of the spear. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I I want 
<laughs> if they launch nukes, I want them to hit my house. <laughs> I want them to come down my yeah. chimney. Quick and easy. I don't want to be three miles out of town watching skin bubble on my yeah. forearms no, and flesh no. fall off my face and yeah. watching my kids slowly start bulging and bopping. And, no, no. Hit the house. Hit the house. Instant. Hit Instant. the house. Yeah. I'll I'm offer on board. it up. <laughs> I'm on board with that. The only... Um, Addition, I would say, is I would probably take like 10 tabs of acid. Oh. As soon as I heard the sirens. Oh. I'd go straight to the medicine cabinet. I'd get my favorite medicine, and I'd be gone. Listen. And it would be so entertaining. It would be so fun. I'm not a, traditionally a looter, but <laughs> if that liquor store is closed, yeah. I'm going to ride that dude's Enduro <laughs> that I just straight pulled off. Through. Fucking straight through. Just yeah. wheelie right through the fucking <laughs> plate glass. Yeah, like, whoever dude. I knocked off that motorcycle, I'll be like, I'll get you a handle of vodka too, bro. Don't <laughs> yeah, worry yeah, about yeah. it. You're not going to outrun this thing. Yeah. But we can't out drink it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, I'm not planning a bunker. I'm not hitting up a private jet. I'm not pulling favors. I'm throwing on a dead album, and I'm taking 10 pounds of mushrooms. Yeah. To the face. <laughs> I'm with to you face. too. I'm not going dead though. I'm who are you my, choosing? My strategy again. Yeah. This is running toward the toward. tidal wave. Uh huh. AirPods in. Who's playing? I put on Man Eater by Hall and Oates because I hate <laughs> that song. And if if I'm if I'm evaporated, if I, I'm turned into dust uh-huh. halfway into it, I'll look at it as a win. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you don't have to suffer through the rest. I'll do that on flights sometimes when there's turbulence. I'll just put Man Eater on and be like, well, if we go down, it's going to be a push. Yeah. It's going to be a push. Jeez. It's a strategy, people. Yeah. You're going to die going, oh, I didn't hear the rest of Uncle John's farm. <laughs> right, I don't want this to right, Oh, you'll right. be in purgatory going, where's the rest what of that the, song? What was that lyric? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. He was about to hit his guitar solo. You're not thinking straight. No. Yeah, you're going to hell in a bucket. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, let's do some, let's break. Let's break and All do right. some news right after this. Magic Spoon, my New Year's resolution was to cut back on sugar and add a little more protein to my diet, stay on track with my fitness goals. Well, there's good news. Magic Spoon makes that easier and more delicious than ever. They have a variety pack of four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter, which I happen to enjoy the most. This pack has zero grams of sugar, high protein, four to five grams of net carbs, only 140 calories per serving. They're keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. And while they're all good, I'm a sucker for the peanut butter flavor. And for those of us who've been going without cereal for a while because it was too carby and too sugary, this is a beautiful alternative. So go to magicspoon.com slash Adam, grab a variety pack and try it out today. And be sure to use the promo code Adam at checkout for five bucks off your order. If you want some cereal and you've been doing without, Magic Spoon's your answer. Right, Dawson? Go to magicspoon.com slash Adam to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Adam at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, start your day off right with a delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash Adam. And use the code Adam to save $5 off. Let me tell you about uh, Simply Safe. According to FBI data, most home break ins happen in broad daylight. As days get longer, you need to protect your home with Simply Safe. We've used Simply Safe here since they've been sponsors, and that's been over a decade. And when you move, you can pick up your system and take it with you. So you can have an, an apartment or rental or something, and then you go buy a house and you take the system with you. Name best home security system of 2024 by U.S. News and World Report. Best customer service, according to Newsweek, 24-7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day. Half the cost of traditional home security. No long-term contracts. 60 days risk-free. If you don't love your system, you can return it for a full refund. Protect your home today, and my listeners get 20% off any new Simply Safe. Two eyes in there. Any new Simply Safe system, and they sign up with Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash Adam and save that 20%. It's simplysafe.com. 
Edible.com slash Adam. First time I ever had an edible, my buddy came in and he was like, hey man, just have this crispy treat, dude. It's homemade, dog. It's homemade, bro. It's chill, dude. Just have like the edge of it, though, dude. Just there's a little bite right there, dude. Just corner, dude. Just three little crispies. Dude, snap, crackle, and pop, my guy. This is for you. But I was in my fucking yeah, dude phase, right? So I ate the whole thing. Turned into a couch. 20 minutes later, I was watching my chest go up and down to make sure I was still breathing. Planning my own funeral in my head. You ever been there? Think about who's gonna speak and what they're gonna say, and do you need to give them notes? It was bad. Like an hour later, my friends walked in. They were like, yo, we're getting tacos. What do you want? And what I thought I said was, yeah, let me get two chicken and two steak. But what I actually said was, Brent Pella is on the Adam Carolla Show. Brent's got a funny stand-up special, which is on YouTube as we speak. Brent Pella, conscious bro. And I, uh, I demand you check it out. Uh, all right, Chris, you got some news for us to get into? Yeah, so you guys are talking about RFK Jr. Well, the New York Times have reported that he has approached NFL quarterback Aaron Rodgers mm. as a potential running mate for vice president. I like it. You like I like both those guys. Yeah, but we're, there's no rules anymore. Yeah. There's no rules. There's no rules. There's no rules. So we can do whatever we want. I love Aaron. Aaron's a cool guy. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the crazier ticket, the better these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Plus, he's got an arm. So if someone tries yeah. to throw a bomb into the Oval <laughs> Office or something. He's catapulting that bitch Boom. right back, dude. Way outside. Yeah. 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 Going deep. Yeah. Out route. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, there are actually two potential candidates that they've been taught that Kennedy seems been talking to. So Aaron Rodgers is one of them. They've confirmed that they've been talking pretty continuously for the past month. Mm-hmm. And former Minnesota governor and professional wrestler, wrestler Jesse Ventura. Uh, listen, I like Jesse a lot too. <laughs> These well, are look, the two I, guys. Well, I, I mean, let's let's really break down the game film because I I find myself having this conversation a lot in life, where it's my sort of like <clears throat> I don't know why it makes me think of it. Like some people go like, "Well, we'll get the Domino's pizza," and I'll go, "Why don't you go to the place Vitello's on the corner there and get like a good pizza?" I go, the Domino's is, you know, cheap or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'll go, I, I know, but it's not free. Yeah. I mean, it's it's nine bucks versus 13 bucks. Aren't you worth that extra? And so you kind of reverse engineer stuff. It's like the difference between a bad pizza and good pizza is $3.49. Right. It's not, <laughs> right. it's not zero mm-hmm. versus 13 bucks, you know? And so you go like, well, Aaron Rodgers, and then you go Bobby Kennedy Jr. But then you go, all right, but let's, Let's just look at Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Like, what? who are we comparing them to? Right. You know, I'm like, both of them have 10 cent heads, like real 10 cent heads. Now, I don't know that they're intellectually. Look, what's the difference between being compromised intellectually, like having no ideas or good ideas or articulate ideas or smart ideas? And having those, but never saying them and saying dumb ideas. Right. Like, aren't right. you the same person? So if I took the dumbest kid in the class and I said, you're a dumbo, and if this is math class, so remember, two and two equals five. And you're like, well, all right. And then I took the Asian kid who's a math whiz, and I go, sorry, your answer is two and two equals five. And you go, well, I'm way smarter than that. I go, I know, but this is the answer. Uh Just say it. So then we're in the same place, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Like maybe Kamala Harris is a genius who's just told to say dumb shit (laughs) and and, and, and back dumb policies. Uh Well, then we're in the same place. Same spot. Right. So something intellectually or morally is wrong (laughs) with them. And I don't see that with Kennedy or Aaron Rodgers. Mm Mm-mm. Can you imagine somebody running into Kimmel's office and going, hey, Trump isn't in an office. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Who is? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. That would be um, – I want Aaron to get in just for that to happen. <laughs> yeah. That would be incredible. So uh, aside from Aaron and Jesse Ventura, mm-hmm. um, there's all the camp has also said that they've spoken with Tulsi Gabbard, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rand Paul. Love Rand Paul. And Andrew Yang. 
interesting. Yang's interesting, but Yang kind of showed his colors because he did go over to CNN for 10 minutes and spit out all the crap they shoved up his ass for mm-hmm. like 10 minutes and then at a certain point I'd like, love to see Tulsi I can't do this I'd yeah. love to see Tulsi or somebody in politics that hasn't been like a former celebrity I don't think Aaron would take it if they are really talking I don't think Aaron would do it he wants to win a Super Bowl but uh, you know he's coming back to the Jets um, but Tulsi would be awesome I think yeah, I, my only problem with her is that little weird skunk tail thing she's got with sure, her hair. Sure, sure. I don't she's know like what that Rogue is. From you don't X-Men. like that? Is that a thing? I, I like it. Is I it think cultivated? It, I think it's natural. It's natural. Of stress. It's, yeah. She had like a whole thing. <laughs> no, whole thing. Only the right side of her head stressed. <laughs> I, hear, I hear like uh, I hear like birthmark stealing. The left stuff. side listens <laughs> to Rasta <laughs> music, you know, like reggae, and the right side, <laughs> right is side, busy yeah. doing long form calculations, <laughs> <laughs> worried about the budget. The right side is having How is it the right side of her head stressed out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, look, if it's natural, then so be it. I got no problem with it. I think yeah. it's natural from her time uh, serving. I think it ha- just kind of naturally happened that way. Okay. Yeah. That's well, we got to look into it because yeah, I'm right. not. We'll I'm fact not check sure. it. I'm fact check it. We'll fact yeah. check it. Uh, mm-hmm. Jesse Ventura, it uh, looks like he has said that if asked, he would do it. Yeah. How do you find Jesse Ventura? Isn't he living He's in a camper grill, right? shell? <laughs> no. Tijuana He's not right active now? in politics right now, is he? No, but no. He's, he's a great interview. Cool. Here's, what I got, here's what I got on that from uh, CNN. Um, Tulsi says that she started going gray in that one spot mm. during and after her first deployment to Iraq. Mm. And she is not going to dye it the same color as her hair. She's just going to let it go to serve as a remembrance. All of right. That well, Brent's right. Oh. Not good. Right. Okay. Well, then she can be vice president. Yeah. Be- <laughs> we'll allow this. <laughs> I'll now give her my seal of approval. <laughs> um, all right. So in, in Brent's special, he has this really great bit about guys uh, tr- before they start a fight and they're just yelling threats at mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. Um, I encourage everybody to watch it in the special. But there was actually something like that that happened in San Diego recently. It was a California yacht owner. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> he was yelling at a dock worker. Yeah. Oh, God. And uh, we can watch. We, you can just play it, Byron. I'll kill you. I will basically saying, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I will kill you. The guy in the boat. I will kill ship, you. As he's pulling away. It. Listen, if you work at, if you're on that San Diego dock, and you don't have a suck my dock chamber, <laughs> you are missing yeah, out. Just, just you know what I mean? The bird. <laughs> so the guy on on the yacht, if you uh, rewind it just a little bit, Byron, he ends up, oh, it's right there. He just ends up showing his ass? He, no. He goes helicopter he with helped. his cock. Yeah. No way. Yeah. He's crazy. This guy's crazy. Yeah. He's an entrepreneur, <laughs> AJ, AJ Thakor. He's, He's in a 4.5... Uh, million dollar Technomar for Lamborghini yacht. It's got a Lambo yacht. And they're using way too many pixels. Yeah. They do not need that many pixels on that area. What a yeah. compliment to use that many pixels. Yeah. 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 I'd yeah. be stoked. I'd be like, oh, they made me look good. Yeah. Yeah, he's such waving his dick. I, so, I guess he was trying to dock where he wasn't allowed to right. dock. And so, and um, the dock worker says, look, I just flipped him off. I didn't know what else I could do. I was trying to keep my cool and avoid the escalation. But some parts that weren't in the video, the guy pulled out $100 bills and was just tossing at him, and, it, it, tossing them into the water. Good. <laughs> and he says, not only not only did he threaten to kill the dock worker, but he claimed to have connections who could totally oh, mess up his mm, life, too. We're getting into legal mm-hmm. territory yep, here. Yep. Now you we have I mean? a case. And now we move from fight to case right (laughs) i know aquaman (laughs) (laughs) yeah dude people especially in san diego that that whole bit i do is based on experiences i've had in san diego of just drunk dickhead bros that yell at each other and just keep moving further and further away (laughs) there's nobody nobody wants to fight everybody's nobody wants to fight people want to look like they know how to fight also, always takes a turn for the homoerotic, you know. What always, I mean? no, there's always a shirt that comes off. I'll this guy's bend jerking you over it. And make yeah. you my bitch, bro. I'll suck your ear till you call me mommy. What? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Fuck come you! I didn't come say anything. Me. Come on me. Come, come at on, me. What? Nothing. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck me. What? A little bit. Huh? I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, come on. Just a tip. Just a tip. Bro. You can't take this fist inside yeah. of you unless you unless you can. Yeah. Let's talk about it. You're lucky what? I'm not lubed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd fucking lube my fist up and put it in kitty litter. Dude. Go right up your ass, bro. I, I fuck dudes like you for breakfast. Yeah. What? Yeah. Nothing. I'm in I need a burrito in my in my butt. Fuck you, dude. Fuck me is right. This bar isn't the only thing I come out of. <laughs> I came out of a closet in my step. Dad, that's where I learned to fight. <laughs> yeah, it's it's this well, this guy. I think there's no other form of transportation where, like, in a car. I'd say mainly, like, in a car, whoever's driving, as a rule of thumb, it's it just a regular commute. Whatever, I'm not talking about partying, or whatever. But like, in an automobile, the driver's sober. And the passengers are sober, as a rule. And in an airplane, the pilot is sober, and most of the passengers are sober as well. But boats have a ratio yeah. of sober Much captain and fucking plaster yeah. passengers. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's yeah. a huge chasm <laughs> yeah. between the guy who's steering the boat and the guy who's doing the helicopter <laughs> cop to the dock. <laughs> Yeah. To the dock worker because <laughs> there's no doubt you're shit faced. Yeah. Because you don't have to steer the boat. Yeah. And there's tons of booze on that on that boat. So this is probably alcohol induced. Hundred percent. Say. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, alcohol or cocaine. So this guy, the the guy on the yacht, he actually made headlines last or in 2021. Excuse me. He got, he went he, he went against a local pizza place. Mm. Yeah, in La Jolla. Right, so, mm-hmm. so the founder of the pizzeria said he originally dealt with uh, these uh, defaming social media posts and negative review sites about the establishment, and then it escalated um, to where the guy gets a plane to fly over the uh, pizza place. This is just, just say no to take and bake pizza. Wow, no Puts way. decals all over the um, the guy's cars in the parking lot. Like he's a petty dude. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And he's who a- do we know who the guy is? Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's an entrepreneur. I could give you his name here. Let's dox him. AJ Thakor <laughs> also goes by the name Ace Rogers. Wow, oh, boy. Yeah, <clears throat> he should oh, uh, nightmare. be Kennedy's vice president. <laughs> I've heard for he this guy. Be, yeah, <laughs> and look, he, he makes give, things happen. Give him his due. He's consistent. He drives a Lambo on on land. On land. If he yeah. got into a Camry, I'd be like, oh come yeah. on, you got a Lambo boat. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. hit the. 101 and you're in a camera but he's lambo through and he's through he's lamboed out yeah right well he claims that that pizza place uh didn't let us didn't let him park his car uh because he was uh indian <laughs> that's how they roll yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so um there's a uh, a california mom who is accused of orchestrating this nationwide shoplifting scheme that uh, stole millions of dollars. So, you know how we always just see those smash and grabs and all the, and everybody in the Walgreens and the and the department stores. Well, this woman, she's um, she's 53 years old. She lives in I think she lives in San Diego as well. Wow. And so she orchestrated this thing where she hires a bunch of uh, a bunch. She hired like a dozen women. Uh huh. To go. All over the state and all on other states too. She would fly them out. She give them car rentals, travel expenses paid completely, and just said, "Hey, I need you to steal these items and mail them to me and give them to me." Mm-hmm. And, then, and then she puts up an Amazon store and sells them. Whoa! Yeah. So she's made like over eight million dollars doing this. Whoa! And so police eventually go to her house and they find three hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff that was stolen. So she's just orchestrating all of this, having people do the. The robberies and um, the the purses and things like that, and then send them to her. I kind of like it. I got a lot of respect. Yeah, for I, got a lot of respect <laughs> I got a lot of respect. I call her a queen pin. Maybe yeah. she should be Kennedy. She should be Kennedy's uh, sec- secretary got, of treasury at, got, at, at minimum. <laughs> she's got chutzpah. Give her a cabinet. This position. one. Well, yeah. look, our case cabinet. Everybody <laughs> crazy. Look, here's what everyone needs to understand. <laughs> there, there's no such thing as like one thing happening without the other. So you can go, I got a plan. We are going to now decriminalize street walkers because it disproportionately affects black and brown women. And Mm -hmm. then you go, okay, like 
that sounds like a good idea, or we're going to defund the police so the police can't X, Y, or Z, or we are going to lower test scores at schools for standardized math tests or whatever. You can do whatever you want first. Like it's, it's a good idea for that day. But at some point, the rest of the people who aren't good people figure things out yep. and then they exploit whatever it is you do. Yep. So now you have more pimps and more prostitutes because somebody in that vacuum is going to rush in and figure out a way to make money. So you can go, you go, no uh, prosecutions or it won't be a felony if people steal less than $950 worth of stuff. It's like, oh, that sounds great. It sounds great. Until... <laughs> The rest of the criminal world figures out what's going on, and then they come up with a plan, and then you go, we should uh, we should decriminalize marijuana because uh, all these drug cartels in Mexico are profiting off the marijuana. Okay, do that. They're selling fentanyl now. Right. That, that's how – and right. doing human trafficking. They're yeah. not doing weed. No. They just do what you let them do, whatever yeah. the next thing is. All right. Rex Chapman, the uh, basketball great – the phenom who has a story that'll blow your mind oh, yeah. with yeah. drugs and uh, wow. the, the highest of the highs and then to the lowest of the lows. I would say most people know him now is he can make like any video go viral on Twitter. Yes, yeah. except yeah. for this interview. Yeah. <laughs> Rex, you've met your match. <laughs> Sorry. 21 clicks. That'll be the match. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brent, you got to come back more often. Please. This Would is, love to. Y'all rock, man. Thank you so much fun. for having me. Brent Pella, Conscious Bro on YouTube as we speak, and Instagram at Brent Pella as well. Rex Chapman right after this. You're about to hear a preview of The Jordan Harbinger Show with iconic musician and producer Moby. It's a super real conversation about fame and mental health. Moby was really open on this one. My first punk rock show was to an audience of one dog, and my first electronic music show was to Miles Davis. 1999, I thought that my career had ended. My mom had died of cancer. I was battling substance abuse problems. I was battling panic attacks. I'd lost my record deal, and I was making this one last album. And I was like, okay, I'll make this album, I'll put it out, I'll move back to Connecticut, I'll get a job teaching philosophy at some community college, and then all of a sudden, the world embraced me. I handled fame and wealth really disastrously. It was so humiliating. I wouldn't trade any of it. For more from Moby, including how he bounced back from a 400-drink-per-month booze habit, check out episode 196 of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto parts. Well, they're in the business of keeping your car on the road. O'Reilly offers friendly, helpful service and parts and knowledge you need to do all your own maintenance and repairs. They've got thousands of parts and accessories in stock, either in store or online, so you never have to worry. If you're in a jam, they'll help you out. When you're a do-it-yourselfer and need a specialty tool to finish the job, well, stop by O'Reilly and uh, ask for one of their loaner tool programs because there's a lot of real special tools when it comes to doing certain jobs on cars. Simply pay a refundable deposit and borrow the right tool, then get the deposit back when it's returned, so it's free. They'll help you find the right part or point you to the nearest local repair shop for help. Plus, they can test your battery for free in or out of the car so you don't have to pop it out. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts are your one-stop shop for all things auto and you can find what you need in the store or online. Stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit O'ReillyAuto.com slash Adam. That's O'ReillyAuto.com slash Adam. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam. I called one of those 1-800 Hot Rod Parts phone numbers, and the girl was working from home. Lo and behold, in the background, I could hear the smoke detector beeping. Later. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. 
Rex Chapman is joining us, former college phenom, NBA star, 12 years in the league. Has a book out, It's Hard for Me to Live with Me, a memoir by Rex Chapman. It's available wherever you find finer books. Rex has had uh, quite the journey, so let's uh, let's get into that. Good to see you, Rex. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Um, where are you living now and how are you doing now? And then we'll start uh, deconstructing the past. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Thanks for asking. I'm in Kentucky right now. I'm born and raised in Kentucky. I'm here visiting for a, a week or so. I live in Phoenix. I, I work with the Phoenix Suns. I'm their Suns basketball ambassador and senior personnel person, vice president of nothing, actually. <laughs> So, uh, but I'm still involved with the game and, and moved back to Phoenix from Brooklyn about six months ago. How good were you and at what age? Like, when was it <laughs> apparent? Well, the reason I ask is because yeah. basketball players and comedians, yeah. they're not all great at 14. You know, famously, right. you know, Michael Jordan getting cut from his 10th grade team or whatever it was, you know, ninth yes. grade. But other guys are clearly, then there's LeBron James, you know, yeah. we know who, we knew who he was when he was 11, you, you know? Right. So where were you kind of in that spectrum? So I, from age five or six or seven, you know, like I, they didn't play me a, with kids my own age. They, I would play against, you know, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders. So I was always advanced for basketball. My dad was a coach and I went to his practices and watched his guys dribble behind their back and between the legs before I, and I did it before I probably knew it was hard. So I had an advantage. I was always much better than the kids in my own grade or a grade or two ahead until like ninth grade. Cause I was a late bloomer. And when I was in eighth and ninth grade, I was very small, um, or five, five, nine, five, eight or so. And so I was always a guard, but over one summer, over a three month stretch, I grew about six inches and, um, you know, and then I, my dad was a professional basketball player too. And my athleticism was very, once I grew a little bit and grew into my body, once I became that, that kind of athlete, then I was again, a lot better than most of the kids I, I played against. Was it? pretty apparent you were going to turn pro were you still in high school when you were sort of thinking about it no that's so no that really wasn't a thing that well you couldn't i don't think you could come straight out of high school into the pros during those years uh so we had to go to college a little bit and even at that if you went to college you were going for four years you were trying to win a national championship and the guys that came out were guys like Michael Jordan, who played three years at Carolina, Isaiah Thomas, two years at Indiana, Magic Johnson, two years. I wasn't those guys. You didn't come out if you weren't. I mean, I was going to be a high pick, but no, I was, uh, I had a tumultuous couple of years at Kentucky. I wanted to stay in school. We were going to go on probation. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the best time at in college and uh, I was ready to kind of move on. Um, I wish it hadn't happened like it did, but in retrospect and to answer your question, as a freshman or sophomore, I was probably good enough to play, you know, in the NBA, but I was still very young. Athletically, I could have done it, but I still even, I came in when I was 19, 20 years old and emotionally and socially, I was overwhelmed with trying to be an adult. You were the first ever drafted by the Charlotte Hornets, so that's interesting. Certain yeah. certain bit of pressure, and then also fledgling franchise yeah. as yes. well. Um, and what did? How did you feel when you got out onto the court in the professional game? Um, it felt great. I didn't like. I I remember kind of looking around at one point because I was the youngest player in the NBA my rookie year by a couple, two or three years. Um, and the older guys always, they, I was kind of like this fun little toy. I think they had, they all put their arm around me and, and kind of took care of me. But I had a one sort of surreal moment cause I was the youngest player and we were playing the Lakers at home and that was Kareem's last year. And so he was 41, I was 20. And this is the Showtime Lakers with magic and Byron Scott and AC green, James worthy. 
and Kareem. And I just remember looking around at one point and just kind of being like, this is weird, you know, because <laughs> uh, these guys are, I mean, they're all timers. Yeah. And uh, once the game started, I was fine. I wasn't very good for the first month of the season or so as a rookie, uh, very wild and erratic. But once I started to slow down and kind of get used to what how the NBA game was, athletically, it was no problem. I, I just had to kind of learn you know, the tricks of the trade and whatnot. And before this and before the addiction pain pills, was there any addiction for you, any other substance? No, no, no substances. But I was, I started going to the racetrack with my father when I was like five and uh, I could read a racing form really like before I could read in school. Um, mm -hmm. and I just thought that's something that, and our rule was <laughs> you can't tell your mom where oh, we're yeah. so, so, you know, I'm lying to my mom at <laughs> you know, five and six years old about, I've been gone to the track all day. But, uh, so when I got older though, I was still, we grew up 45 minutes from a racetrack and in high school, I'd go to the track. Uh, I, you know, if I had 20 bucks, I'd mow yards, get 40 bucks and go to the racetrack. That was like, a, I didn't drink and smoke. And I thought as long as I wasn't doing that, whatever else, I chased girls to, in excess. Uh, I, I, uh, and I gambled. And I should probably say this too. In high school, uh, I, my my like my first girlfriend, first love is a, is a girl named Sean Higgs, and we're still very good friends. Her brother Mark and I grew up together. We knew each other from the time we we're ten or twelve. We we're boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm white, and Sean Sean is black, and people in our hometown, they didn't really dig that. And we kind of hid, hid it from a lot of people, but she went to Kentucky also. She was an all state track champion two years in a row, 100 meters in the state. She was a track star. And I think we both assumed she went to Kentucky also. And we assumed that when we got to the bigger city <laughs> that people's opinions might change on that. And we were walking to class one day and after class, I got called into the coach's office and was told that, you know, I needed the people were talking about it and that I needed to if we were going to date that I needed to do that at nighttime or behind closed doors and not be public about it. And I this thought it is was like 85 or something. This is eight, 86, 80. Yeah. 1986, uh -huh. the fall of 1986. And so. I was very upset. I was very angry. I was very confused. And I just looked at him and said, yes, sir. And, uh, you know, I had that, that was a, that conversation was had another half dozen or so times while I was in school, the basketball part of it was, I don't want to say it was easy. It, it was natural. And I was excelling at that. It was off the court. I was very unhappy, you know, and again, most of my teammates are, are, or black were black and many of them had white girlfriends they weren't being dissuaded from dating them i just felt really i felt trapped i didn't have any i didn't feel like i had anyone to talk to and i felt like what they were telling me was morally wrong so that's a i started yeah i started kind of having some real you know situational depression naturally but i also started feeling like a fraud because I, they were projecting this image of me as this great student and I didn't care about school to begin with. Uh, and this all American kid and, and apparently my having a, a, a black girlfriend was just a bridge too far for them. And it was, uh, you know, it was institutional racism. I didn't know that there was a name for that at the time. I didn't know. I just didn't feel like I had anyone to talk to. It's a very interesting distinction because historically it's the black man dating the white woman that society frowns upon, you know, and there's all kinds of implications involved with that. Right. And, but that's society where you hear, you know, every song where somebody gets shot by a dad, it's the, Right. white girl is dating the black guy, you know, that's, right. that's the story. It's like, yeah. you, you don't hear about, it's like, you don't really hear about transgendered athletes, transing, you know, switching from a, 
from a female to a male and then competing with the males on the football team like that, that you only hear it the other direction. You know what I mean? And yeah, I, I feel that way with race it, by by racial couples. You only hear that direction. So it's interesting that they pulled you out of line and did this. And maybe it's because you were supposed to be better than that. Like you're sort of the great yeah, see, white hope. But see, that's the that's that's what I heard. And when they're saying this, I first of all. You know, I have my own insecurities and whatever. I didn't feel like anybody. I was good enough to be dating anybody, much less my girlfriend, Sean. And they're sitting here. They haven't even met her. And they're telling me this. So it's just it's racism. But it goes deeper than that. It's, you know, myself, I was probably the best basketball player on campus during that time. Her brother was the best football player. We we're great friends. Everybody in both basketball programs knows that I'm being told this, and it's hurtful to me. I get it. Imagine what it was doing to her. Every time I have to go to her and tell her, you know, it's a different hurt. I, I can still, to this day, see her welling up with tears, you know, just. Uh, and what would you it say was to mean. her? It was that I, that I got called in again, and we, got, we, got, we were seen over at the mall last night, and, you know, people don't like it. And, you know, I, after having to tell her that a couple of times, you know, I just started kind of shutting down emotionally. Also, I began running around on her. You know, they weren't letting me see her during the day. I'm an 18 year old kid trying to enjoy college. I can't get into bars because the bars will get shut down if I'm seen at a bar because they know I'm underage. So I start, you know, <laughs> running around. I'm not dr drinking and drugging, but I'm gambling and, you know, just sleeping with with sleeping around which is easy because you're the big man on campus yeah, yeah. i i well, mean I, I assume if you went to ucla you probably wouldn't have experienced this i i you know i've thought about that my whole life and I, yeah i think there's probably uh yeah yeah i think it was very uh location location i don't know I really know how to how to describe it but very much from where i'm from it was it was different and it is different than, you know, some of the bigger cities. Yeah. And it's a double edged sword because it's what makes you, you know, Mr. Basketball or Mr. Kentucky or whatever it is. This is when you're from Los Angeles, there's so much going on and so much distraction mm -hmm. and so many different cultures. We just don't have Mr. So-and-so, you know, right. like, right. you know. Um, if Manny Pacquiao was from Burbank, no one would really care that much, you know what I mean? But he has right. an entire nation correct, a, a weight on his shoulders, you know, and there's yeah. a, you were, you were living a version of that, which again is, is good. I mean, it's, it yeah. gets you, might yeah, get you a free car. Yeah. It's be careful what you wish for. I, I really, I, I've spent every waking moment as a kid playing basketball. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night at, or midnight and be in a panic realizing a, you know, someone in Los Angeles is still at the park. It's nine o'clock out there. They're still playing basketball. I'd get up, I'd go for a run or I'd do a hundred pushups, go back to bed. Like I like, but I liked it and I was good at it, which gave me some, you know, self-worth or that, so I thought, um, but it was my complete identity. That's all, you know, that's all I felt like I was to myself and to others was just a, a vehicle for entertainment. And when did the pain pills begin? The, the, so I, I, uh, I was, again, I didn't drink and smoke. I, you know, I'd, I'd have a beer every now and then uh, when I played. But if I had a beer six, a dozen times the night before a game in my whole career, that would be about right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just didn't. I, I didn't feel like I could do that and play basketball. Um, and many guys can uh, but I, I don't, <laughs> sure but I didn't feel like I could. So, um, I, but I had seven surgeries my last three years of playing and I still had three years and about $13 million left on my contract following my 12th year. And, but I had an emergency appendectomy right at the end of the season. And it, it was, uh, 99, 2000, so year 2000 spring of 2000 and when i got out of surgery or i was i got home to phoenix the doctor gave me a prescription for oxycontin for one month that said you know take this and i was like oxycontin he said yeah trust me it's great and so i was like okay so i took it 
And I say this often. So in in a one or two days, I was in love. Like it was the best thing I've ever. I can't. I can't. So good that I can't imagine what heroin's like. Uh, uh, and I'm I'm very fortunate that you know I was very close. I'm sure running out of money, resorting to stealing to you know support my gambling addict, support my drug habit. Uh, I was c- so close because once you run out of money, you go to heroin because it's cheap and you never know what you're getting. And then, you know, you die. Right. And it's very hard to come back from, even if you do try to. Well, now clean, it's you're going to heroin, but you're going to fentanyl. And fentanyl. And yeah. You don't so know it's it. a whole right. it's a whole thing. And even, you know, I was fortunate in that the medicine, the actual drugs, even the drugs I was getting through a drug dealer, I was taking 40, 50 pills a day. Um they were coming from a pharmacy. Mm-hmm. I would see them, the person in a white <laughs> coat, come out the back of the pharmacy, bring two big giant bottles of pills, we'd pay for them and go. Buying them off the street, that's really dangerous because they do have fentanyl, they have anything in them. Uh, in them. So I was just very fortunate in, in that regard. But yeah, at once I got the Oxycontin, I felt smarter, funnier, like a better dad, better husband. I'd always had extreme social anxiety being around people that I don't know that I assume know me. Like I, I just did. And I, I think you could probably, I felt like a lot of my life because people would come up and want to chit chat. If I felt like I was a dick to them, like, mm-hmm. like I didn't give them enough. They are really excited to see me and you know, sometimes I would and sometimes I wouldn't. The Oxycontin took away that social anxiety completely. I felt nicer. Hmm. I felt like a nicer person. And I never picked up another basketball. I I didn't play any longer. Uh, I was still paid the rest of my contract because I was very beaten up physically. Insurance paid it. But, you know, I blew through that money so fast, uh, gambling, and now Oxycontin habit. Uh, it was a recipe for disaster. So you were 40, 50 pills a day for what period of time? I was, I was, when I went into rehab, after I took Oxycontin the first time in 18 months, I was, I was up to, I was taking about 40 Vicodin a day and about 10 Oxycontin a day. Um, and the only, honestly, the only reason I'm alive is because I didn't drink it, you know, if you drink and you're doing that, you're going to die. Um, and I had just built up my tolerance so much. And I would just chew them up, get them in my system faster, no water. I'd keep them under my medicine or under my mattress at night, reach under there, um, chew them up. But I did that for about 18 months. I went to rehab. Danny Ainge, uh, great Celtic. Boston Celtic, and was a, is a very good friend of mine. He came to me and said, you got to go to rehab. Look at yourself. You know, and I was just 18 months out of playing. I was terribly out of shape. I was, you know, I was numb. And so I went and when I got in there, I heard they were doing a shift change with the nurses and one said, what's he in here for? And I was in detox at this point. And one lady said to the other, he's in for Oxycontin. And the other one responded, oh yeah, that's like, that's, that's just like heroin. Seven days of just hell. And I was like, heroin, what are you talking about? And yeah, so it was, and it was seven days of hell. And it was seven days of hell each time I tried to get off of opioids. Um, but once I got out of that rehab stint, I never went back to Oxycontin ever. I I just felt like it was, it's kryptonite. I did go back to Vicodin after another surgery, I got off of Vicodin and then I was on something called Suboxone for about Mm -hmm. 10 years. Is, uh, now I'm guessing gambling is a no fly zone for you to, just like a beer kinda. would be because it'd be sort of a gateway thing, you know, kind of, I, you know, I've been to the, I'm from Kentucky. Most of my friends own horses, thoroughbreds, and they have stallion farms. It's kind of hard for me to get away from completely. But to be honest, when you don't have money, it's really hard to gamble. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and I've gone for a long time without money. Uh, it, 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 when I go to the track, I've been to the Derby a couple of times since, you know, 2014. I've, I've actually had a good time uh, not gambling. And I didn't, I don't think I ever even knew that people did that. 
or that you could do that. That you could just go and hang out and watch the races and not gamble. That's that's brand that was brand new for me. Yeah. So I feel yeah, that, I feel I feel the same way about flying private and not drinking. <laughs> I didn't know that was a possibility. <laughs> right. But I have flown with people I'm like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. And I'm like, we're in a private right. jet. It's yeah, free. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, we're not flying. <laughs> we're just the passengers. Um, so in gambling, I you know, I don't I've said it a million times. I've said a few things a million times. Because I I sat next to Dr. Drew during this whole period when everyone was doing all the Oxycontin and mm -hmm. all the Vicodin and all this stuff in the mid nineties yeah. and the late nineties. And I would tell him over and over again, this is a windfall for the drug companies. Yeah. And yeah. he would go, It is not. Oh they do God. not want this. And I would go, look, it's a product. And there's people, he had patients that were doing 90 pills a day, you know? And yes. I'd go, well, that's your product moving out the door. You're not making any money off me. You know, I get oral right. surgery once every 11 years and I take four of them. That's not right. going to help yep. your bottom line. But someone who's taking 100 a day, every day, that's going to help. And he was like, they absolutely do not want this. And I, I kept saying, how could they not want it? And then, uh, you know, 15 years later, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. and then they wanted, you know, they, they wanted it, and they've paid billions in fines. Yes. Nobody's gone to jail. It's just the cost of being in the drug business in America for Purdue Pharma. Yes. And, and the, you know, you, you made such a great point. You know, yeah, it's the... If you're taking 100 pills a day, the genius part for them and the monstrous part for them is they invented OxyContin and then the drug that's supposed to get you off OxyContin is Suboxone. They made that. And so right. I took that forever. And you guess what? You can't abuse that. When I got into rehab the last time, people in rehab were telling their stories where they Suboxone is like a little thin sheet you put under your tongue. Like a tab. Tab. And... uh uh, people in rehab were telling their stories of, you know, being down and out and going to needles. They were melting the Suboxone in a spoon and putting it in a syringe and then injecting Suboxone. So it, it's, it's all a racket. It's yeah. all a racket. <laughs> yep. No, it is. And, but, Gambling can undo you faster. Oh, yeah. Because gambling, the, the drug, well, the drug and the alcohol and the whatever abuse of whatever has a bit of a, a of a trajectory, and, and and there's some time involved with it, and it'll, it'll eventually get you. But there's some time. Gambling can bring you down fast. You know, for me, good, the good thing is I I didn't I think gambling on uh, like team sports is just insane and people would say gambling on thoroughbred racing is just insane and i get it it is like uh but you can't like you i and i gambled at in vegas uh blackjack and and whatnot you can lose a ton of money gambling on sports and it, horse racing you're betting against the pool you can't you know you can't make it go and you can make a little money at the track but it, my point is, <laughs> it's a slower death mm -hmm. <laughs> playing, playing right. the track. It became a faster death once I was on OxyContin and had the gambling addiction. And when I say this, I, I, I hope I can phrase this right. Are you guys, either of you, horse players? Um, have you been to the track? Do you know? Yeah, or? I do. I'm not a horse okay. player. Been to okay. the track right. a couple of times. All right. Well, um, Winning a race, like right at the wire on a horse you bet, is a is a really great rush. Like it's a nice rush. It gives you a feeling. Not unlike the feeling of being in a fifth grade basketball game or a high school game and making a game winner or hit, hitting three shots in a row to make the other coach burn one of his timeouts. That's right. a fucking mm -hmm. rush. Oh, yeah. it, <laughs> it feels good. And and you do it for so long that you don't realize then you start doing it in front of crowds and you do it and and it and you do it in practice every day to the other team to the you know you're scrimmaging against that becomes a thing and believe it or not it, a lot of people can get you know can fall in love with that i i didn't think about that but the second i stopped playing <laughs> that's gone and 
unless you fill that with something positive, then there's going to be problem. And I just completely dove right into pain, painkillers to probably fill that void. When did you get completely sober? Uh, I don't say sober. I say clean. I still have a Coors Light from time to time. I medical marijuana. Um, my problem with, with opioids, I don't even really like to drink. Uh, but I've been clean from opioids for nine and a half years now. Uh, I got out of rehab in 2014. And I, really, I feel like the, the medical marijuana kind of saved my life. It really, it, I've been... I've been more functional as an adult, on time for everything, uh, uh, responsible more the last nine and a half years than I've ever been as an adult. Is Do you think the medical marijuana, and I'm just trying to look at this. Okay. Um, you know, I, I always think in terms of I need some reward or some motivation or something to say, look, when you're done with this, then you can do that. You know, right. you can have right. a drink, but only yeah. when you're done with doing whatever. <laughs> right. Punishment reward. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, marijuana is, uh, it, it alters you. Um, it doesn't, you know, I, I sort of like it, but I'm not really, it's not my drug of choice, but I, I kind of get, I'm sort of probably with pot with where you are with booze. You know what I mean? Like okay. it's, it's fine. Yeah. Right. But, um, and, and so like. Like the notion of going through life without ever being altered, if oh, you right. just want yeah. to say it that way. Like, well, uh -huh. sometimes I think about sobriety, you know, and right. they go, John Goodman's been sober for 14 years. And I go, I don't like the notion <laughs> yeah. of just yeah. not being, I'll just say altered because maybe it's pot and maybe it's yeah. booze and maybe it's an edible or maybe it's an, whatever, whatever it is. Maybe it's bungee jumping or something, right. you know, you're, you're right. altering, you know? Yeah. So it's not really not ever being altered. It's how does it alter you and how often are you altered? I guess. Right. And, yeah. And I guess with, with like, I would think if, if someone said to me, you can never drink booze again, I'd go, okay, but I want to be altered a little bit sometimes, <laughs> you know, on a altered, Saturday yeah. night. Right, right. I, and honestly, with the with the way that I do it, I don't do that. Like I, I do it so I can go out. And it helps me get through a workout. I'll I'll have a gummy or uh, hit the vape pen and I'll because I know I'm going to have to go talk to people. And it just helps me. It helps me feel OK about myself, not unlike, you know, I take Zoloft, too. And, you know, if I take a sleep aid at night called amitriptyline. So is that altering me? Yeah. Um, and I don't know how to explain it other than I tried to be without anything for an entire year after I got out of rehab, rehab the last time. And after being on those high powered opioids for so long, the world for 14, it just seemed loud. It seemed loud and very unnerving. And I was doing everything right. And I had started, I was living in California, had started reading about the medical marijuana. This was, you know, 10 years ago. And after I'd gone for a year, I thought, all right, I'm going to go get a, a license and, you know, kind of dabble in this and see how it goes. Told my therapist, no secrets, you know, because that's kind of a big thing for me. I don't need to have any secrets. So she, she, you know, she cautioned me and, you know, I was upfront with her about every step of the way. And I can't tell you uh, from everything from a better night's sleep to anxiety that I've had my whole life. I, you know, made myself throw up from every game from third grade through my first two years in the NBA. Uh, so in so many respects, it quieted, it kind of quieted things for me and allowed me to sit in my emotions and my feelings better, uh, my bad emotions and that's been the hardest thing for me because uh, my whole life, anytime something bad happened, I go to the track. I go chase this girl. I grab a pocket full of pills. Uh, so sitting in my emotions, this help actually helps me to sit in my emotions and not run from them. Um, and that, that's been a very valuable thing for me. And it allows me to 
<laughs> stuff's hard to talk about. Of course. <laughs> and it allows it it kind of allows me to relax a little bit and and be able to articulate my <laughs> my points in such a roundabout way like this. Well, I mean, I guess in layman's terms, we just go it works for you. Right. You know, right. and I, I think sort of the yeah. new world order for if you talk to Dr. Drury, you talk to him and he talk to anyone, they go, Well, what what exercise is best? And the answer is whatever you'll do. You know, right. whatever whatever you're into. Let's do not... we consider I have a question. Do we consider cigarettes altering? Yeah, I would. I would say I, they're stimulating. I mean, I've never smoked, but I, my dad, mom smoked, and you know, relatives. Well, they're from they Kentucky. Smoked. You have to well, smoke. Yeah. <laughs> <You're talking. laughs> yes. you got to gamble on horses. You got to smoke while you're gambling. Smoke. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's a st- uh, nicotine's a stimulant, just like caffeine is a stimulant. Right. So then you'd have to kind of go. Well, people drink caffeine. I mean, I definitely right. find I, myself thinking about coffee in the morning. Uh, I'm like, Diet Coke. Like I drink twelve of them. I right. for real. That's I can I can quit OxyContin. I cannot quit Diet Coke. So that's uh, I have to. I have to yeah. have my life. <laughs> well, you have you because you've you know. So there's this thing that I you know I would always ask. I get up, I used to do Love Line. I used to work at night. Yeah. I'd come home at 1.30. I'd come home at 12.30 at night. I'd go to bed at 1.30, 2 in the morning. I'd wake up at 9.30, 10 in the morning. I'd get my shit together and I'd go to the man show and work on that. And then, but every once in a while, and I wouldn't even eat breakfast normally. I'd have right. a cup of coffee, maybe a piece of fruit, and I'd walk out of the door. And then at some point I started to realize when we'd have to catch an early flight to Tampa to do some show or something, and I'd got up at 5 in the morning after I went to bed at 2 a.m., and I got up at 5, yeah. I'd be sitting at LAX at 6.15 in the morning going, man, I need a sloppy Joe or a breakfast <laughs> burger. I need beef and cheese and ham, and exactly. I need something shitty and gooey and greasy yeah. and yeah. hearty and savory and i was like wait a minute this is three hours earlier than i normally wake up so why are you so hungry when you're normally asleep and then when you do wake up you don't even eat so why are you starving now at 5 45 in the morning and i was like (laughs) because i'm traumatized that's right and i need to give me something there's a there's a there's a reward there's an infant inside of me that's crying because he he had to get up for three hours sleep and he needs his baba (laughs) <laughs> and his hunky bookie and he needs it yeah. now. And I feel I feel I feel that way about coffee. You know what I mean? Like I got yeah, I'm not I'm getting up. I'm traumatized. I mm-hmm. want something. I need a yes. reason to get dressed. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're, so, you're describing you are so describing like an NBA athlete uh, that it, 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 back in the day when I first came into the NBA, we, we had we flew, flew commercial. And if you had a get, if you played, you know, back to back, the rule was if you're in Indianapolis and you play tomorrow in New York, you got to take the earliest flight out of Indianapolis in mm-hmm. case there's weather, in case there's whatever. So those are 430 wake up calls on the bus at five. Most of the guys are still come in their suits from the night before, <laughs> been out partying all night long. And then you get to the airport and everybody's starving and right. they're not starving we're right. just traumatized <laughs> we got to play again in a few hours and let me have something for me right now right? i know and that's why <laughs> that's why we invented breakfast sandwiches and breakfast food like you think about airport breakfast there's no place that's called just pears and bananas because if someone handed you a green pear, you'd go, get this the fuck yes, out of my this? face. I need yeah. hash browns. I need gravy. I need melted cheese. I need ham. Exactly. I oh, want to, yeah. I want a turducken and you got to <laughs> melt, you got to put cheese on that turducken. Like every greasy, horrible thing, every oh, carby, yeah. greasy exactly. piece of piece of food just sounds so yes. great when you're so beleaguered. I know. And and a piece of jicama or broccolini or something would be like, get that out of here. I wouldn't even eat Offensive. it. Offensive. I wouldn't either. I would say. You're showing me a, 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 I'm, it's dark outside and you've given me a pear. I might I, throw that. I would you. go. Yes. I would go. I'm starving. And they'd go, all we have is broccolini. And I'd go, get the fuck out of here. I'm not eating anything then. <laughs> On principle. I, 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 I was like, are you hungry or aren't you hungry? No, you need no. to be soothed. 
Yeah. You need to be hugged by a piece of ham and told everything's going to be all right. Yeah. And that's why. So, and I and I get that. Diet Coke, coffee, right, right. cigarettes, yeah. alcohol. And then, then, then the whole thing is, it's like, there's stratas with alcohol. Okay, can right. you have oh, a light yeah. beer? Do you want a stout? Right. Do you want an IPA? Yeah. Do you want a double IPA? How about a nice yeah, whiskey? Not, How about some bourbon? Me. How about some tequila? You know what I mean? Like when, yeah. then, yeah. then we're moving into the pills, then we're getting of into course. heroin. You know, it's like, the, yeah. it's this balancing yeah. act. And it's also a, I will stop here. At. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I know that I can't, I, I don't like, I, I can't do anything where if I feel like I'm running from my emotions, I have to sit in them. I have friends that keep me very accountable with this. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I try not to run from my feelings. And if I'm going out with friends and we're going to have a beer, I drink only light beer on ice. On ice. Like on ice. On oh, ice. The wow. shittiest water beer. I normally <laughs> say Coors Light, but I switched to Miller Light recently because it's even waterier. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I can sit there and have a couple of beers and enjoy my buddies. And, and you know, I, I honestly, I just feel very grateful and, uh, to be alive because a lot of addicts and especially a lot of addicts from this part of the country. And you guys know, I mean. You've traveled and you've been everywhere um, doing shows and whatnot. It's very rural. And a lot of addicts that come from this part of the country, by the time they bottom out, they have burned everyone in their families, yeah. most of their friends. Most people don't travel outside of a 50-mile radius of where they live here. It's just how it is. It's very rural and it's a poor state. And so I've been so fortunate that I had so many friends and even people that just knew me from basketball, people that, you know, I had so many people, I didn't lose any friends. I didn't, I had so many people that were there to help me at my lowest, so many people that you would know, you know, straight people that you wouldn't know. Uh, and I, I feel very grateful and fortunate that in that regard because so many people don't have that, and it's a harder process when you've got to, got to, you, Most of us, we get out of rehab or we've got legal issues. Every one step forward, two steps back, and you got to continually not reach for the pills or the alcohol because it's it's hard, and you're just learning to kind of walk again. I had so many friends to be able to help me. You just got to think about there's so many people that don't have that, that circle and that sort of safety net that, that I fortunately had. It's a very hard road to recovery for most people. Did you go through all the money? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How, many, how many millions would you estimate? I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> but I, I made about $40 million playing, probably 33 or four contractually um from nba teams and another seven or eight in endorsement shoes and all that stuff i was i was fortunate in that in that i didn't go into crazy debt mm -hmm. uh and, and my ex-wife and i we split and she unfortunately <laughs> she was able to get you know get some money uh for she and our kids or it all would have been gone oh. so she's all a, right yeah she's a saint and um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's you lost it in the divorce, but you would have lost it with the drugs. Oh yeah, you, yeah, and the, and the gam and the gambling. Oh, the gam gambling. Yeah, right. the gambling was. You know, I would go to the track. I never went to the track with less than seventy five hundred dollars in my pocket, and most of the time it was fifteen thousand. And if I lost, if I won that day, or you know, and I won fifteen, thirty grand, or whatever. Great. And it might last me for a week or two or a month. But if I lost 15, I go to the bank and get more and go back the next day. And that's that's just stupid. Oh, I mean, I, I, you know, I've thought about this before, you know, I'm making three million dollars a year playing basketball. Winning fifteen thousand dollars or forty five thousand dollars at the track when I make that in a game. uh was not going to change my life, but losing that eventually <laughs> is going to change my life. 
And I remember having that sort of conscious thought from time to time, but feeling, well, and, and I'd blown so much. It was like, you know, you're emptying a swimming pool with a spoon. Like I, I had, you're chasing it, you're chasing right. it. And then I'm on the drugs and it's, it's just a terrible cycle. Yeah. It's weird. Cause I feel that way too. Every, every time I, I pick out one of my kids will order Chipotle and then throw half of it away in the garbage. And then I pick it out of the garbage and I go, what are we doing here? And then I go, yeah. wait a minute, what am I doing? I make millions of dollars. <laughs> this is $4 right. worth of beans and rice. And I go, right. I'm not throwing it away. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's a weird relationship you have. Yeah. And maybe it's distorted because when I, you know, you didn't, you didn't have this, but when I used to work construction, I started as a laborer and I made $7 an hour. So I dug ditches for $7 an hour. And right. so when I would be out on a Saturday night and someone would say, you want to order a beer? I'd be like, how much is the beer? And they'd be like $5 and 39 cents for an Amstel light. And I'd go, well, that's what I take home after taxes for right. one hour of digging ditches. Uh, so yeah. everything was a calculation. Yeah. And when you dig ditches, it's the opposite of professional athlete or the You're opposite exactly right. of, you have this perspective that's I, I actually did. I, I'm, I'm so glad you said this. I actually had, I, I worked on a horse farm here in Lexington my first summer and it was the only work I've ever done. Right. The, I mean, we were painting fences, digging post holes, mucking stalls. It was awful, awful. That being said, I, I go from, I never started doing playing basketball to make money. I, played basketball. And, and in fact, when I was a child, uh, many basketball players had side jobs. Like you didn't make tons of money playing mm -hmm. basketball. And so plumbers and firefighters. Right. Right. And, right. <laughs> and so I honestly, I never, I never really felt like I earned the money that I had. It was just, it was a byproduct of what I did. And so I, Obviously, I, there was a disconnect with me and the money that I was making, and <laughs> it was uh, it was I obviously it was very skewed in my mind uh, the value of a dollar, the relationship right. you had with right. it. I'm glad you brought right. this up because I, I do want to get your thoughts on this because you were a college phenom. Um, Nick Saban just spoke to Congress about. Uh, how he thinks that all the college players now, because of the name, image, likeness uh -huh. uh, money they're making, is causing them to lack resiliency. He's saying NFL coaches <laughs> are saying like these guys are too entitled now. Like uh, they're they're not able to overcome adversity, things like that. Do you think that's an issue? All right. So um, maybe I don't I don't I don't know, but I just find it fascinating. Now, this name, image, and likeness thing, let's get this straight. So when I went to Kentucky in 1986, I had to sign a national letter of intent, and it gave Kentucky my name, image, and likeness in perpetuity forever. I was in over at UK with a daughter of mine going to Kentucky, out-of-state tuition over here with a thousand other parents and their kids, and they're showing that the uh orientation video and i'm in the fucking video twice <laughs> and so they they've had i was paid under the table through boosters mm -hmm. um you know that's and that's pretty standard for top 25 programs illegally this was illegal at the time through with the ncaa and the schools They've all known this forever. Mm -hmm. The NIL is no more than the boosters paying you on top of the, the table now. Right. The schools are not doing it. And until the schools actually do it, it's going to be a fucking disaster until they get there, decide, look, these are pros. We got to pay them like pros. It is not amateurism. It's never been amateurism. It's pro basketball. They're, you're being paid. These fans are coming to see you and schools don't pay their labor. It's been great for them until now. 
And as far as Nick Saban goes, look, Hall of Famer, amazing. And I, I do, right, respect to where he's coming from. Co- there's been a lot of coaches that have stepped down in the last three or four years, and I do think it's because of the NIL. And here's why. Guys like Nick Saban, all, these are Roy Williams, uh, Jay Wright. These are veteran coaches. They have been coaching and recruiting a certain way for many years. And you, prior to the last few years, you could browbeat kids all you wanted to get them to do what you fucking want them to do because you're their only avenue to get the fuck out and make money playing professional sports. You have to do what they said. I had to do what the University of Kentucky said or I wouldn't have a shot. Now, kids are making a little money in school and you can't treat them as shitty anymore. You, They'll leave. They'll go to another place. So I get it. But this is America. Um, you know, you got to be paid for for your labor. And athletes haven't been paid. I say this, athletes. I'm talking about the top 25 programs where football players and basketball players go to play basketball. Those are money making machines. That's a very stout and uh, mm-hmm. competent answer. And yeah, in football. <laughs> there's injuries. I mean, you know, well, there's injuries, career ending that's, injuries, that's, especially. That's in the football. other thing. I, I, you know, and I've talked about this before. We didn't weren't paid in co- we weren't paid in co- or we were paid in college. But the football players go through something. Whether you play five years of pro ball or five years of college football, that's five years of CTE. That's and right. And these guys do not have insurance they don't have pensions it's bullshit they have the same uh, career ending knee injury limp from age 23 that the guy in the pros has and that we've just and these guys are put through the mill i mean they shoot themselves up they do get out there the football players go through it it's one thing for basketball players i get it the football it's a whole other issue because mm-hmm. that's it's just negligent to not have them by now you know, with insurance plans and and pensions. And, you know, if you go to play four years of college at a major college uni- or, or university that's on TV every week and you're the best player on that team and you're not specifically good enough to go on and play more, you should make a million dollars a year, you know, at, at uh, North Carolina State if you're the point guard. It's just, it's been maddening to watch happen. Sorry. No, that's all right. Let me give the book a plug. <laughs> it's hard for me to live with me and Wimar by Rex Chapman. Rex, uh, I don't know. I don't say this to many people I've only known for 45 minutes, but I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, buddy. Uh, Thank you. I'll take it. And I'll take it. And uh, I'm, I want to hear what you have to say in the future. And I'd love it if you'd come back and check in with us periodically because you're such a great I'll, interview. I'll do it anytime. I've been a fan for a long time, Adam. Um, you know, grew up watching you guys. Um, well, of course, you're a little bit older, but not that much older. Just a I'm few a years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rex, thank you so much for joining us today. Got it. Thank you, guys. I do Have appreciate it. I want to thank Rex Chapman. I want to thank Brent Pella for coming in. Yeah. His stand-up special, Brent Pella, Conscious Bro, very funny as well. West Palm Beach, going to be doing stand-up at the Kennel Club. Two shows, uh, one Friday, one Saturday. And that's uh, coming up as uh, this weekend. Right. Yep. This Friday, Saturday, Reno, the Newman car collection going to be out there with Leno. That'll be uh, March 30th. So come on out until next time. Sam Corolla for Chris Max and Pat and Rex Chapman and Brent Pella say it. Mahalo. <laughs>